Um, so I also will have to kind of assume that everyone has read the paper, read Chris's paper really, really closely. <laughs> um, and I say that just because they're actually I haven't written anything. I mean, I have. There are all these pages, but um, but it's almost all quotations. So if you've memorized what you've written, meaning maybe that's Chris, you'll actually hear them as quotations, and otherwise you may not. So um, you know, every once in a while I'll do something like that, uh, but most of the time I won't even do that. So in a world not limited the way ours is by time, by the limits on time for preparation, but also the time for presentation, I would have liked to formulate uh, 18 questions for Chris about Styron's Nat or the metaphysics of presence, one for each of Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history. But it is not merely contemporary historicism that would not have much time for, for the long moment indistinguishable. That's, that's a quotation from the paper. Um, that is also, in part at least, the condition, our condition, as conference participants. Historicists or no, we're all on the clock. Um, and, you know, it's many clocks. It's Ishai's clock, and it's me prodding Ishai to mind his clock. And, um, but there's no, no need to rush to identify with the villains, and historicism is the clear vision in the methodological drama. So historicism is the infidel in, in Chris's crusade. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for identification with villains once we find another mode of historical practice, once we manage to move beyond method. And when we do, there will indeed be villains, good and evil, angels and demons, black and white. And in fact, much of what we will try to do, or what I'll try to do, could be captured in a phrase that is a pun, um, and it is displacing gray. So, <laughs> right, gray, gray writes writes up these confessions of Nat Turner. So time is short, and I'll be brutally reductive. I would hedge at this point, but there's no need, because your questions are going to be directed at Chris, not me. So here's my take on what, on what Chris is up to. Um, Chris has rolled two tasks into one. First, like Styron, but with a great deal more sophistication, he's involved in a meditation upon history, a search for method. Second, at the same time, and this is what he's just said, he's developing an attempt to write a history of the Southampton Rebellion. And there's a paragraph where these two tasks are articulated together. And this is all a quotation from Chris's paper. What remains is the question how one might save Nat Turner from those, like William Styron, who would befriend him by giving him rational dimensions so that he might be yanked into the American present to teach it a lesson it could understand on its own terms. How might Turner instead be encountered on his terms so that now quotation inside the quotation, the past and the present moment might flash into a constellation at a moment of a specific recognition that teaches the present not a moral lesson about itself, but instead that is itself a collage of dialectical images, of critical constellations in which precisely this fragment of the past finds itself with precisely this present. How does one overcome the metaphysics of presence, which dictated both the construction and the reception on all sides of Styron's <coughs> Nat, without surrendering the past? So one has to build an historical method that resists historicism and perhaps resists professional history more generally. So one has to rescue, and that's Chris's word, and he repeats it, one has to rescue Nat Turner from the historian's cartoonish caricature. So I want to look at these one by one before rejoining them in a few minutes. First, historical method. So Chris follows Benjamin, not surprisingly, and says, historical perspective dispels self-contained facticity. Articulating the past historically means appropriating a memory as it flashes up in a moment of danger, at the moment of its recognizability, which is now. So this isn't the first time Chris has looked to Benjamin as a guide for generating historical sensibility. If Chris had to have a slogan over the past few years, I think it would be um, sort of in opposition to the old Marxist slogan that used to be thrown down against the structuralists, which was always historicize, and Chris's would be always constellate, um, if that's actually a verb. <laughs> but, um, 
So, what part does Styron play in this? I'd say it's a double role. First, Styron's non-professional history is an alternative to the way history is developed as a science. It's palpably unconcerned with cataloging, classifying, contextualizing so deeply that all becomes an endless thicket of contingent complexity. With or without Styron's acquiescence, it combines white America's need to know black America in 1967, and particularly the need to understand black, Amer black American violence. Now, as an aside, I'll mention that Chris, professional historian par excellence despite himself, cannot resist correcting Styron's factual mistakes, <laughs> nor can he resist following Styron's trail the way only a detective or an historian would have the stamina to do. So it seems that every word that Styron uttered about the confessions for the decade preceding and the 35 years following its publication, um, and almost every word uttered about Styron make their way into Chris's record. So Chris, if you were wondering, does not share st what Chris calls Styron's insouciance about, about research. Uh, he's, he, so Styron's doing something important, but not, um, it, isn't, it isn't quite exactly research. So, and, and Chris takes his research completely seriously. So back to Styron. Styron fails in part because despite his verbosity, he's inarticulate about his own purposes. <coughs> and paradoxically, this is part of his appeal. He lacks the sophistication that threatens to ruin historical insight through its own professionalization. And Chris notes Styron's notable, noble but failed attempt to constellate, which ends in hauling a piece of the past into the present so as to inform a current conjuncture with moral reflection upon a prior atrocity. Styron's attempt to make black rebellion comprehensible in 1967 instates the urgency of historical investigation. So that's the half of it that, that in some way works. But while the attempt fails, it is, in Chris's estimation, not without grace. So another aside with a question. Right? Chris has been sort of generating a catalog of failed, failed attempts at constellation. Um, so a, a bunch of them published, and some of them, I think, not so. And it leads me to ask whether constellation always performs by failing. And if I had one question on method, it would be that. But so, why why does you know a word on why it why it fails on the that is on the particular failure of of Styron, and then onto a bigger question, which is where Chris's history of the Southampton Rebellion will come out. So perhaps the, f the primary failure in Styron's history lies in the fact that it's incapable of taking seriously <coughs> Nat Turner's religious conviction. Styron secularizes his Nat, and his explanations for doing so revert to a characterization of the historical Nathaniel Turner as a psychopath with crazed visions. Chris would rather try to recover the layered meaning of the soterial salvation-oriented. I had to look that up. So. Everyone knows the word soterial. Um, soterial speech of an ascetic 18th century evangelical Protestant. A speech that justifies extreme and even murderous violence, but is neither fanatic nor insane. In all of this, however, we're still somewhat in the dark about Chris's own stake, not in his intervention vis-a-vis -vis Styron, but rather with <coughs> relation to Nat Turner. His history of the Southampton Rebellion will be a constellating history, and if it fails, it will not be for want of articulating its methodological convictions. The open question pertains to the precise interest in the present that gives the constellation its meaning and that ensures that it is more in the way of making a dialectical image than a hauling of a piece of the past into the present. So I'll go out on a speculative limb and I'll combine two discussions that probably don't belong together. Um, but it's too late. So one, one is somewhat straightforward, but not very well specified. Uh, you know, a little reflection about the present. So today's, today's present finds the left, at least the left, in the West, particularly in the US, but also beyond that, completely unequipped to engage seri seriously with religious conviction, particularly with a religiously formulated demand for justice and its political manifestations. And this is true internally, where the left simply cannot engage with the religious basis of its religious right um, or rights, so whether that's in the US or in Israel or I think a lot of other places. And much more pointedly, where religion-based resistance and resistance to capitalism are often combined, which is 
outside of the, the domestic set. So that would be one part of a present that would lend interest to const constellating Nathaniel Turner. Um, right, it would be a way to try to figure out something about what religious conviction means to f formulating political demands. Um, and then on a completely reg different register, uh, and I'm hoping that this is not a crazy combination, um, we find the question of grappling with the role of violence, both as resistance and as the possibility of founding a new order. So here's a jumping off point for thinking about that. At the very end of Chris's masterpiece, Freedom Bound, which if you haven't read this piece really carefully and you are thinking about what of Chris's to read next, um, read Freedom Bound. It's more important than this piece. Um, he, <laughs> he contrasts. He, he's sulking. <laughs> well, you know, this, this piece will eventually be an, an important, magisterial and important book about the Southampton Rebellion, and you can wait for that if you haven't read this piece yet. So, um, but, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Freedom Go Bound is great. Um, so at the very end, he contrasts uh, two Shakespearean characters, Aaron of, of Titus Andronicus and, and the Tempest Caliban. And Caliban isn't important for us now, but Aaron is actually the very image of Nat Turner, uh, though the similarity goes completely unmentioned there. It's not, it's, not on, it's not on that page, but Aaron is black, defiant, committed, willing to kill, willing to die. And Chris quotes the following lines that Aaron speaks to his son when he's about to flee Rome. He's engaged in this uh, basically revolutionary plot and, rev and revolutionary murder. And he says, come on, you thick-lipped slave. I'll bear you hence, for it is you that puts us to our shifts. I'll make you feed on berries and on roots and feed on curds and whey and suck the goat and cabin in a cave and bring you up to be a warrior and command a camp. So just for a sense of the echoes, if you were to read Turner's confessions. Um, he, he meets his cohorts at a place called Cabin Pond, uh, and he characterizes the, his hiding place. He hides after the rebellion for about six weeks, and he characterizes it as a cave, although it's, a, it's, it's a, just a, something that he's dug out of the thicket in the grass. So he calls it a cave, even though it's, it's really a hole. Anyway, the, this, this little passage just That's constantly echoes with with those things. But Chris's use of Aaron has nothing to do with Turner. Instead, he marks a ferocious capacity for clear choice, for the use of violence and resistance to corruption and evil. He's viewed by the order of law as demonic, but he's the only marker of the kind of virtue that could found a state after the demise of another state. So professional history with its painstaking accounting of complexity seems unable to support a decision against compromise when the costs are immense. Resistance to professional history seems like tilting at a windmill. And Chris writes, perhaps, nevertheless, one should risk the tilt, cabin in a cave, become a warrior, command a camp. So choosing to undermine order, right, in the context of freedom bound, the, that order whose central compromise is slavery, choosing civil war, meant facing a brilliant clarity. One might hope that our present, our present, does not require choice of such tragic force and proportions, but to the extent that it might, one might also hope that our history will allow us to recognize our present for what it is and give us the fortitude not to avert our eyes.